Kidnappings are crimes that are in a league of their own. Not only are the victims, of course, affected, but family and friends are left tormented by the uncertainty of what has occurred and whether or not they could have done something to stop it. Sometimes, though, the answers are never found. Here are five kidnappings that still have unknown endings. Number five, Timothy Pitson. No one is promised tomorrow. That's why, for a father like James Pitson, he always made it a habit to tell his son, Timothy, that he was a good boy and that he loved him. Born in Aurora, Illinois, six-year-old Tim was the only child of James and wife Amy. And on May 11, 2011, James dropped his son off at school like he had done many times before. Shortly after that, though, he was then picked up by his mother, who took him on an unannounced three-day trip to various amusement and water parks around the area. Two days after that, Amy called up several family members, including her mother and brother-in-law, to let them know that the two were okay, but she never called her own husband. Later on that day, Amy was seen out alone at a dollar store in Winnebago, Illinois, where she bought a pen, paper, and envelopes. A little while after that, she was spotted alone again at a grocery store, so where was her son Tim if she was the only grown-up around? At around midnight, Amy checked herself into a motel, and there she took her own life by overdosing on antihistamines. And after she swallowed them down, she slashed her wrists and neck and then let herself bleed out. The following day, when a maid came in to clean the room, to her horror, she found Amy's body. Alongside it was a note where she apologized for what she had done. She further explained that Timothy was in safe hands, but up until this day, no one knows if that is in fact true. An investigation was immediately conducted and they discovered that while the knife Amy used to kill herself contained only her blood, a concerning amount of blood was also found in her car and that DNA belonged to Tim. Going back in her past, Amy had a series of tumultuous relationships and was even married and divorced three times before settling down with James. She also had a history of severe depression which only became worse over the years. So much so that before being successful, she had tried to commit suicide two times before. So, could she have, out of despair and mental anguish, also killed the child and hid his body somewhere? Well, her family didn't seem to think so. It was later revealed that Amy sent a series of letters to her parents telling them that she gave away her son to someone who would take care of him and that she assured them that he'd be safe. The investigation into where Tim was continued, but never led to anything concrete. Towards the end of the year, police were notified about a potential sighting of Tim at a restaurant, but when they tracked down the child, they found out that he was somebody else. So the months turned into years, and the years turned to a decade, but the mystery of Timothy's disappearance still remains. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children continued to operate under the assumption that Timothy could still be alive, and his father James also remains hopeful that one day he'll be reunited with his son. Number 4. Alexis Patterson A mother's intuition is a powerful thing. When something is slightly off of the situation or person, they can usually pick up on it quickly especially when it involves their child. For Ayanna Patterson, the moment she didn't see her daughter where she was supposed to be, she knew something was terribly wrong. Every day, at just about 2.50 in the afternoon, Miss Patterson would be home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, waiting for her 7-year-old daughter Alexis to arrive from school. Considering that the distance from her elementary school to their house was only about 250 steps, it shouldn't be more than a five-minute walk. But on May 3rd, 2002, the routine was unexpectedly broken. Laurent Bourgeois, Alexis's stepfather, had walked the girl to school that morning, and later that afternoon, shortly after 3 p.m., 
Miss Patterson's instincts kicked into gear with worry when her daughter was still not home. Despite still being weak after having just given birth to another child weeks prior, Patterson ran to the school as fast as she could. She asked everyone around, teachers, students, and faculty, but not one of them recalled even seeing Alexis the entire day. Distraught, she then went straight to her grandmother's, who also happened to live nearby, but like everybody else, she too didn't know where she was. Left with no other choice, she called the police, who mobilized a unit assigned to track down the girl. And three days in, there was still no sign of Alexis, and authorities then began to tell reporters that it was possible that she had run away. This theory came from Ayana's revelation regarding an argument that occurred between her and Alexis, and detectives believe that the latter may have been so angry that she decided to skip school. It was unfortunate timing because by 2002, Wisconsin still hadn't adopted the Amber Alert, a system where the general public is immediately notified about any child gone missing. Though the incident was plastered across the local news stations, it would take almost three days before the first story of Alexis's disappearance was widely disseminated throughout the country. Meanwhile, as per protocol, investigators questioned the entire family and both parents were polygraphed. Now the mother passed with flying colors, but the stepfather failed. However, he still strongly denied any allegations of being involved with her disappearance. Police still continued to set their sights on Bourgeois, who was once apprehended for driving a getaway car in a bank robbery that happened in 94. It was thought that perhaps, since the little girl wasn't his legitimate child, he wanted to get rid of her and start fresh with his wife and newborn. Fast forward 14 years after the incident, a development surfaced about a woman living in Bryan, Ohio, who might be Alexis. Based only from an age-progressed photo of the girl, Patterson said that this could be her missing child. However, DNA results yielded a negative match. And so, this case continues to go unsolved, going on more than 20 years now. In 2021, Bourgeois died of a drug overdose. As such, no one can prove or disprove his possible involvement in the disappearance. Number three, Brittany Beers. For sure, Brittany Beers was told, as many of us often were, never talk to strangers. On the evening of September 16, 1997, six-year-old Brittany hopped on her bike and rode outside her Village Manor Apartments complex, which sits along U.S. Highway 12 in Sturgis, Michigan. About an hour later, Brittany's mother, Tina Steltler, went out to run some quick errands and along the way out saw the girl still cruising close by on her bike. Shortly after that, Brittany's half-brother also went out to get some fresh air and he claims to have seen her sitting on a bench nearby taking a rest. And then, another resident of the complex later reported having seen the girl talking to an unknown man driving what was described as a red or brown mid-sized car. The same witness subsequently told investigators that the young girl was happy to tell them about a new friend she had just met. And this statement appeared to be a little bit unusual, especially for her family, who knew how skittish and wary their Brittany was when it came to talking to strangers. Tina eventually returned home at around 9 p.m. and told her other son and daughter to go fetch their sister. And they did as they were told, only to return explaining that they couldn't find her anywhere. Police were immediately called to help in searching for the girl. Volunteers and many of the apartment residents also joined in looking for any clues or signs of the six-year-old. They searched incessantly, all the way to dawn the next day. By that time, it became apparent that Brittany may have actually been abducted. One of the many challenges they faced during the operation was the fact that Beer's apartment was located along a main road through Sturgis. This meant that if she was in fact abducted, it could have made a quick escape without being detected by the neighborhood. The search party was able to cover over 40 acres of land, which included open fields, railroad tracks, and storage buildings. And throughout all the efforts, the only thing they could find was Brittany's bike, which 
was abandoned on the side of the road close to her house. Meanwhile, a composite sketch of the man seen talking to beers before she vanished was distributed throughout the town. Though it failed to garner any leads in the early stage of the investigation, it did bring forth an interesting development years later. Authorities have no reason to believe that the girl wandered off on her own. Rather, she may have been abducted. By whom, no one exactly knew, however police think the problem may have stemmed from someone very close to home. In the following year, allegations of physical and sexual abuse led authorities to remove Brittany's little brother and sister from that same apartment. According to the reports, the girl's father and an uncle, who at the time was living with them, had both allegedly abused the young kids. For many decades, Brittany Beers' disappearance remained an open case, and in 2015, almost 20 years since the incident, police announced that they had a person of interest, and his name was Daniel Furlong. Furlong was arrested for the abduction and murder of an 11-year-old in 2007. The man was also considered a suspect in a separate kidnapping case where his victim, a girl, had managed to escape. Aside from the similarities in Furlong's crimes in which his targets were young girls, he also resembled the man drawn in the composite sketch from all those years back. Now in prison, Furlong maintains his innocence in Brittany's disappearance. Was it him, or perhaps one of the men in the family, or someone else entirely remains to be seen? Sturgis police still urged the public to provide any information that could help them find the missing girl from Village Manor Apartments, so reach out if you have any details. Number 2. Samantha Burns The future looked promising for a young college student named Samantha Burns. This tragic story begins on November 11, 2002, when Marshall University student Samantha Nicole Burns called her mother at around 10 p.m. She told her parents that she had been visiting friends at the Marshall University Courtyard Apartments, but would be headed home shortly. See, at that time, the physical therapy student lived with her family in East Hamlin, West Virginia. The travel time between Huntington and East Hamlin was around 45 minutes or less, so... She should have been there soon. But much to her family's worry, Samantha never arrived home that night. Their worries then turned into panic when sometime at around 3 in the morning on November 12th, a report came through that Samantha's burgundy 1999 Chevy Cavalier was found abandoned near the Cable Wayne County line in Wayne County, West Virginia. The discovery was made when police received a call about a vehicle that had been set on fire. It was still burning when deputies arrived on scene, but they didn't immediately make a connection between the burning car and the missing college girl. Apparently, in this part of the country, it's not that rare to find burned vehicles since most of the time, cars that have been stripped of their parts are often set on fire. But by the time they realized that a woman had gone missing and that this particular car was the one she drove, things began to take a mysterious turn. Less than a week had passed since the incident, and police announced they had identified two suspects in what they believed to be an abduction case. These individuals were Chadwick Folks and Brandon Basham, both of whom had escaped from the Hopkins County Jail just days before Samantha went missing. These men then embarked on a multi-state crime spree, including robbery, car thefts, multiple assaults, and murder, where they stole a woman's car and kidnapped her before disposing of it. Both fugitives were later recaptured and resentenced to death because of their new crimes, one of which would be the purported kidnapping and murder of Burns. But because of the evidence and the other crimes were so damning, they never fully got all the details in Burns' case. Prosecutors said the men most likely abducted the girl, held her at gunpoint while they drove her car, and then eventually killed her before lighting it on fire to get rid of any evidence before finding a new ride to steal. Basham would go on to plead guilty to the charges in Burns' case. However, authorities still do not know where the convicts hid or disposed of the body. Number 1. Allison Dalton 
The disappearance of Allison Dalton is both tragic and mysterious. On July 27, 1998, a co-worker of Selena Dalton entered her apartment on Charles Street in Strasburg, Virginia to do a welfare check. And there, the woman was found lifeless, drenched in her own blood with five stab wounds to her chest. As shocking as that was, to add to the terrifying crime was the fact that Selena's two-month-old baby, Allison, was not in the apartment with her. The infant was missing, and so were her milk bottles, and so it was assumed by police she must have been abducted by whoever her mother's killer was. Upon the investigation, it was determined that Selena was killed sometime in the early morning, though neighbors swore they didn't hear any screams or hints of a disturbance that day. One tenant said that he did see a man putting a baby in a truck. Sadly, though, detectives couldn't trace who that person was or even find the vehicle, as the witness had very little information on the details. For a town as small as Strasbourg, Selena's brutal death came as a shock. The woman had no known enemies, although she did have some issues with a disgruntled ex-boyfriend, Daniel Pomple, whom everyone believed to be Allison's father. But still, it wasn't anything out of the ordinary, although it was noted that at the time of the murder and supposed kidnapping, a single mother was seeking child support from Pomple. Upon interrogation, Pomple actually told police that he was at Miss Dalton's apartment that morning, shortly before the murder. He said he knocked on the door, but when no one answered, he simply decided to leave. Two years later, in 2000, Selena's mother sued Pomple, seeking $1.5 million in damages for her daughter's wrongful death. However, the court dismissed the lawsuit due to a lack of evidence. Pomple has never been brought up on any charges relating to Dalton's death or the child's disappearance. He's also been cooperative with authorities, although the victim's family and friends were quite convinced that he has something to do with the incident, one way or the other. Both Selena's homicide case and Allison's whereabouts have yet to be solved to this day. Everyone's hopes now rest on the possibility that a new slate of information may one day surface to bring an end to this tragic double mystery. So that's it, guys. Hope you enjoyed our episode today, and thanks so much for tuning in. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next one.